Hey guys, I hope you're all doing well and welcome to another edition of Level Up. So today you've got me, Shemalori, and we'll just be talking about what it means to identify falsehood in the 21st century church, but not just identify the, first, the falsehood in the church, but also our reaction to that as Christians, what that actually means to us and how we can use that in order to be better versions of ourselves, especially as Christians, and how this means we should interact with the world both the physical world and the online world as it were as well but before we get into it let's have a quick word of prayer father lord we are so grateful for everything you're doing we're thankful for your grace we're thankful for your mercy lord we are thankful for your protection upon each and every one of us we thank you that in every situation lord and in every in every mode that you make yourself known father we give you all the praise and adoration in Jesus' name we've prayed, amen and amen, amen. So let's head straight into it and let's just discuss what types of falsehoods are present in the modern day church and both in the world as well. So let's talk about all of them and I split this topic up into four main groups. So number one is the falsehood of theology. So this means, well we'll, we'll delve into it a bit deeper, but falsehoods of theology is the first one. Number two is the falsehood of doctrine falsehood of doctrine number three is the falsehood of the online world i.e fake news and all those type of things there and number four is the falsehood of the individual so i'll repeat it again number one falsehood of theology number two falsehood of doctrine number three falsehood of the online world fake news and number four the falsehood of the individual so just to clarify some other bits because this one might need a bit of clarification so for me the falsehood of individual means certain things Falsehood of the individual refers to the falsehoods we believe in ourselves sometimes and sometimes even about our faith. There are a lot of things that we believe they can, might have been as a result of the way we grew up, um, as a result of the teaching we had when we were young, that are actually false and not the way God wants to see things. And it's important that we have that ability and we gain that ability in order to see things the way God wants to see it because that's the most important thing at the end of the day. And this also touches a bit on false teachers as well. And that's when we get falsehoods from other people because they reinforce our own individual falsehoods. So let's go straight into it. Number one, falsehood of doctrine and theology. Um, I decided to mix these two falsehoods together because I believe they are very interlinked. And I believe they offer so much in terms of knowledge that they can give each and every one of us. So let's go deeper into what it actually means. So what does doctrine mean? Doctrine refers to taught beliefs or ideas which are believed to be true. Key word there is believed. So you can have a doctrine that you believe and you think is true with all intents and purposes. However, it's actually not true. And regardless of what is believed, which is what I'm talking about, and which I said believed is a key word, the only thing that actually matters is the word of God and God's true doctrine and what that actually means. And a doctrine can only be seen as true if it is backed by God's word. I'll say that again. A doctrine is only seen as true and the true doctrine if it is backed by God's word. And it also needs to be backed by the spirit of God as well. And the spirit of God lives in each and every one of us who say and who have accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and personal saviour. Sometimes throughout times in life, we may feel that that spirit is far from us or we may feel that um that we might feel separated from that spirit due to um circumstances in our lives one way or another however if you're a true believing son of god daughter of god that spirit is in you you just need to awaken it it is there it never never left you just need to awaken it put yourself in an environment where you can get yourself more in tune with that spirit again such as reading god's word just dwelling in his presence and that's um different things which we will talk about but moving swiftly on We've talked about what doctrine means. Now let's look at what biblical doctrine means. And this helps you understand what true doctrine, which we mentioned previously, actually is. So that means the biblical doctrine, what is that? Teachings which align with the revealed word of God. And what is the revealed word of God? That's the Bible. That's the word of God given by him to each and every one of us, written by man through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So if we've talked about the revealed word of God. That means it's also important to know, and we've talked about this biblical doctrine and this true doctrine, 
as well it's also important to know that there is false doctrine too what does that mean false doctrine is any teachings or are any teachings which take away which add which contradict or nullify the doctrine given in god's word very 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 key and another point as well going back to the biblical doctrine which i wanted us to talk about on when i was writing this is that if we also have the revealed word of god which again we've seen biblical doctrine we also have the unrevealed word of god as well which sometimes god only reveals to certain people to prophecy for example however a key point here is that the unrevealed word of god never ever ever and should never contradict the revealed word of god which is seen in the bible so that's one key point i want us to 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 take in regards to identifying what falsehoods are or what falsehoods are the falsehood or whatever it is the falsehood or to identify a primary falsehood is if it contradicts the word of god so i'm not saying you can't get unrevealed revelations which are available to everybody but if it contradicts what the word of god or if somebody says something that contradicts what's found in the bible then that's red flag and that's something that should that should tune or prick your ears up to the fact that it could be a falsehood so let's look at biblical passages which also back this up as well if we open galatians 1 6 to 11 briefly galatians 1 6 to 11 so i'm just trying to get them up on my on my um thing as well so galatians 1 6 to 11 here we are galatians 1 6 to 11 and I believe this was Paul um, talking to the to the church in Galatia at the time uh, about not having any other gospel apart from the one which had been preached to them. So I'm just going to briefly read Galatians 1, 6 to 11. Galatians 1, 6. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we are, or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. As you have already said, so now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you expect you other than what you accepted, sorry, let them be under God's curse. Am I now trying to win approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. Verse 11. And this was Paul saying again. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preach is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. And I believe this is also like a charge to us as well, that we need to remember that the gospel which we are preaching as Christians is not from man, is not from your guy down the street. It's actually breathed, spirit indwelt, breathed from God. And it was revealed by revelation of Jesus Christ. So everything we see in the Bible is revealed by the revelation of God's spirit. And that's something we need to take into our mind and into account with everything that we do as well. Even in the way we talk, the way we act, those are things that are very, very important. Key, key principles, which we always, always need to remember. And this also sort of solidifies the validity of the doctrines in the Bible, the biblical doctrines, which we talked about as well. So if you open Galatians 2, 1 to 5, again, it's Paul saying similar things. In Galatians 2, 1 to 5. So in Galatians 2, 1 to 5, Paul is saying, I will read from verse 1. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem, this time with Barnabas. I took Titus along also. I went in response to a revelation and meeting privately with those esteemed as leaders. I presented to them the gospel that I preached among the Gentiles. I wanted to make sure that I was not running and I had not been running my race in vain. Yet not even Titus, who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised even though he was a Greek. This matter arose because some believers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom which we have in Christ Jesus and to make us slaves. We did not give in to them for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. And this was a key point. At this time, 
it was as if they had some people who believed in Jesus Christ, but they were also trying to bring in like Jewish customs, basically. So Jewish customs at the time were circumcision, which everybody knows about. And they're trying to bring this in into the body of Christ. And what's Paul saying here? Paul is saying, no, that's not of God. Because that is actually not biblical doctrine. These are people trying to infiltrate. And it was actually saying they were false believers because what they believed wasn't in, a, in accordance with the gospel that was taught of God. And he was saying that these are false believers and they're trying to bring you things which are not of God. And you might think, okay, on the surface it's good. Yeah, it's in line with Jewish tradition. But what did Jesus Christ say? Jesus Christ say he came to change the way things were done. He didn't say he came to abolish it, but he, changed, he came to make it new. He came to renew it and make it in line with what God's original plan was. And that was exactly what he was doing and circumcision was not included in that otherwise he would have said that while he was alive but he didn't yet you had people in the church who were trying to bring that in and that's also very important to know and even in regards to our lives as well and how we do things even in the church there will be some people sometimes that will be trying to mix things which on the surface seem good on the surface it seems like there's no issue with it however is it in line with what god is saying is it in line with what god's word is saying and that's when we need to start looking out for mistruths in the church and falsehoods in the church in regards to theology and also in regards to doctrine as well. All these things are very, very important to look out for and also very important to have in our minds as well. It doesn't mean we should always be suspicious of everything we hear, but we need to be like the Berean Christians, which is something we'll come back to later. Looking at everything in the word with a deep high. And it's important that we pray for the spirit of discernment. And for God to help us to discern between different doctrines and different theologies and to really hone into which one is God truly speaking in. Next, moving on. So let's talk about the signs to recognize false doctrine and false theology as well. So again, this is not me saying or oh, this doctrine or what this church is preaching is definitely wrong or what that person is saying is definitely wrong. No, I'm not here to do that. What I'm here to do is just to uh, give you some signs to look out for. Also, with biblical examples as well, which I'm going to encourage you to go and read up yourself. I won't be able to go through all of them, but we'll try to discuss most of them. OK, so I've got five key things here and signs of things we can do for ourselves and things to look out for in order to recognize false theology and doctrine. So number one. If the teaching that is being preached looks to other wisdoms or knowledge before God's instruction, that's a key sign. So if they're talking about other things, everything else bar God, that's something to tell you, or that's a sign that tells you that hmm, something is not, it's not necessarily right here. Okay, let's look at where it says that in the Bible. Look at or open up, let's open up or look at Isaiah 8, 19 to 20. Isaiah 8, 19 to 20. Isaiah 8, 19 to 20. In Isaiah 8, 19 to 20, it says, When someone tells you to consult mediums and spiritists who whisper and mutter, should not a people inquire of their God? So in this instance, the people of Israel they oftentimes sometimes they might consult mediums they might consult spiritists we even saw that there was a time david even did that as well and this was isaiah saying to the people why are you doing that why can't you go to god directly why consult the dead on behalf of the living that's how it carries on going verse 20 consult god's instruction and the testimony of warning if anyone does not speak according to this word they have no light of dawn what is he saying? We need to look to God's instruction first before we do anything. God's instruction, and that's something we should also look in regards to theology and doctrine that's being taught. As we do that personally, we also need to look at if the teaching we're hearing is also doing that, if the doctrine we have in a particular place we're in is also doing that as well. These are very, very key things. Number one, just to reiterate, first key point was if the teaching looks other wisdoms or knowledge before God's instruction. Number two, if the teaching professes that Jesus was not the Christ. And this was something that happened a lot and it still happens a lot now as well. And I think even with the whole rise of the whole spiritualist movement as well, a lot of the doctrines and a lot of the things that 
they say are actually found in the Bible and they're actually on the surface of it seemingly good things in regards to manifestation, all those type of things. They're they're things which are found in the Bible with a God basis. But the only difference is those things don't have Jesus Christ at the center. They don't put Jesus Christ where he should be, which is the author and finisher of all those things. So let's look at first John chapter two, eighteen to twenty three. First John two, eighteen to twenty three. First John two eighteen to twenty three. So in 1 John 2, 18 to 23, it says, Dear children, this is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. See, this was even in Jesus' time. This was John, who was actually a disciple of Jesus Christ, saying this. How much more now? And this is why we also need to be very, very vigilant. I'm going to carry on reading. This is how we know it is the last hour. Verse 19. They went out from us. But it did not really belong to us. So this was John saying that there were people in the church who they would even leave or and go out from the church, set up their own ministries, do what all, all they need to do. But what they were saying and what they were preaching was in line with what God's plan was and what Jesus Christ's original vision was. They were saying things which were in accordance to what he had in plan, which he had in place. So I'll read verse 19 again. They went out from us, but it did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going showed that none of them belonged to us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and all of you know the truth. I did not write to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it, and because no lie comes from the truth. Who is the liar? It is whoever denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a person is the Antichrist, denying the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever acknowledges the Son has the Father also. As for you, see that what you have heard from the beginning remains in you. If it does, you also will remain in the Son and in the Father. And this is what he promised us, eternal life. So what is that passage telling us? That passage is telling us that the most important mark or the most important thing to tell is somebody if what somebody is saying is really as a result of their relationship with Jesus Christ, in regards to teaching anything, is if, if, if they acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the Christ. That's the most important thing, if Jesus is the Christ, sorry. Because at the time, a lot of people were calling themselves Jesus. Jesus was actually a common Hebrew name. It wasn't anything special. It was the Christ that was the important bit. It was the Christ that was a sign of him being the Messiah. It was the Christ that there were so many people at the time that would say they were the Messiah. There were so many people at the time that would say, I'm this and that. And they would profess that they were sent from God. However, it was Jesus Christ that really showed his name and showed his power. That's why the name of Jesus Christ is so powerful. It's not something to be played around with. And it's something we also need to take quite seriously and a charge as well. So next, moving on into the science to recognize false theology. The third one is, if the fruit slash character of the environment doesn't line up with the teaching of Christ. So if you can get people who say the most beautiful things, who speak in the most eloquent manner, who can do so many great things. However, and sometimes, I'm, this is going to be quite a key one, they might even showcase things which seems to be gifts from God. And that's key point which seem to be gifts from god but what is the true judge of who they are is if their fruit slash character if the fruit and character of the environment in which they're presiding if it doesn't line up with the teachings of christ and the teachings of christ where are they seen they are seen in the bible and this is why we also need to read our bibles as well because sometimes you don't know what you do not know so if you don't know what the fruits of the spirit are what we should see in positive christian environments you won't even be able to know if it's not there Right, so let's look at passages which talk about this in a bit more detail. Matthew seven fifteen to twenty. Matthew seven fifteen to twenty. Matthew seven fifteen to twenty talks about this quite well. It says, Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit, verse sixty, by their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good 
tree bears good fruit and every bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown in the fire. Thus by their fruit you will recognize them. And this was Jesus. This was Jesus speaking. I'm even going to read to verse 21. And this was something we hear so many times. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And that is seen through the actions. It's seen through what they do. Again, he says only the one who does. Doing is an action word. You need to see it by their actions. You need to see it by what they do, what they produce, their fruits and their character. And what are the fruits we should be looking for? These are the fruits that are found in Galatians 5, 22 to 26, which again, I'm not going to read to you. That's why it talks about the fruits of the spirit. And I believe we can all read that in our own time. And 2 Peter 1, 5 to 11 also talks about fruits we should be looking for as well. And sometimes in some passages as well, I believe in the later versions or the later passages of the Galatians, he also talks about things we should not be looking out for. So that's also why it's very, very important that we should read. And even in Galatians, he even talks about key signs of false disciples. So he even adds more things in order to look out for when looking out for false disciples or people who are spreading falsehoods. And that gives us a charge wherever we are or wherever you are listening right now i believe that gives us a charge and what is that charge what are we meant to do with having such a trove of information in regards to things we should be looking out for it's one thing to know it but it's another thing to be able to recognize it and also to be able to sometimes call it out as well and how do we do that and how do we even get to a point where we can recognize it the most important thing is that we pray for the spirit of discernment and we can see that in malachi 3 verse 18 and we talk about why it's so important to pray for the spirit of discernment in malachi 3 verse 18 it says and you will again see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked between those who serve god and those who do not and how do we do that and how do we get to that place where god is saying you will see the distinction how would we see this the distinction we need to pray for the spirit of discernment. In that passage, in the preceding verse, God was saying he was the one that would show us the distinction. God has shown us the distinction and has given us the ability to gain that distinction. How did he do that? He gave us a helper, which is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gives us the ability to do all those things. The Holy Spirit gives us the ability to be able to tell right from wrong. The Holy Spirit gives us the ability to be able to tell if something is of God and something is not of God. And sometimes the world we live in now is actually always, it's not a matter of right and wrong, but it's a matter of uh, a truth and a mistruth. Uh, there's a difference between a truth and a lie and a truth and a mistruth. A mistruth is a truth which, no, is is a lie which is spun in a way that seems like a truth. So it's not necessarily a lie, but it's not the truth either. And again, just in general, you see so many examples of this. It's something politicians are very good at doing. When some politicians, you ask them a question, they don't give you a direct answer, but they spin it in a way that you be thinking, did you even answer my question? And that's sometimes what we see in the church a lot of the times, not in regards to questions, but even in regards to key tenets of the faith, in regards to why we believe what we believe, and in regards to how we as a Christian, no, we as a society, a Christian society should even be impacting the world as well and the, the level of impact we should be having in the world. And that's all things we need to take into account and look out for. One of my favorite quotes by Charles Spurgeon, he talks about what discernment is. And it says, discernment is not knowing the difference between right and wrong. It is knowing the difference between right and almost right. So it's not saying, being able to say, oh yeah, this is definitely not of God. And this is of God. But being able to say, this is of God. And this sounds like it could be of God, but the spirit in me is telling me it's not. And in the world we live in, those are the things we should be looking for. Things aren't clear cut. And we as Christians, we need to know that the world we live in isn't a black and white world, but it's a grey world. It's a grey world and above the grey and above all of that, what gives us colour, what gives us light is God's word. And it's only God's word that will help us to see things clearer as well. So let's pray for the spirit of discernment right now, wherever we are. It is very, very important. And it's a prayer point. Even we, even me, myself, I'm trying to gain and imbibe 
as well. So moving swiftly on, how do we defend ourselves against false doctrine and false theology? And again, there's a case study here, which I'm going to use. I, I, again, I mentioned it previously. I mentioned it earlier. The Berean Christians. We find the church of Berea talked about in Acts 17, 10 to 15. So let's open that up quickly. Acts 17, 10 to 15. And I totally understand I'm talking to people on an online platform um, via YouTube. So you can open it in your own time. But these passages are very important. Whether you have a pen or whatever, just be writing them down so you can read them in your own time. And we'll actually talk about that. Why the ability to do that is very, very important. So Acts 17, 10 to 15. Sorry, let me just bring it up. Acts 17. 10 to 15 in Acts 17 10 to 15 it says and it talks about when Paul went to Berea so verse 10 as soon as it was night the believers sent Paul and Silas at a way to Berea when arriving there they went to the Jewish synagogue now the Berean Jews were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true as a result, many of them believed, as did also a number of prominent Greek women and many Greek men. But when the Jews in Thessalonica learned that Paul was preaching the word of God at Berea also, some of them went there too, agitating the crowds and stirring them up. The believers immediately sent Paul to the coast. About Silas and Timothy stayed at Berea. Those who, cost, those who escorted Paul brought him to Athens and left with instructions for Silas and Timothy to join him as soon as possible. But the key bits in these passages is verse 11. Now the Berean Jews were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. So they didn't just hear the word with great eagerness, but they received it. Okay, I'm hearing what you're saying. However, I'm going to go into the scriptures myself to see if it's right. I'm going to go into the word of God myself to see if what you're saying aligns with the word of God, which is why we talked about the first point. There has to be something. And the things which are said, they have to be something which are, which are aligned with the word of God and aligned with God's instruction and aligned with God's wisdom. Those are the most, most, most important things. And what does that teach us? And what does looking at the people of Berea teach us? They're telling us that these people sought God, even though their knowledge of God at the time will still not have been, been to the level it should have been because they didn't know who Jesus Christ was at the time because that's when they were still Jews. And they didn't know who Jesus Christ was for themselves. They were looking at things from a knowledge point of view firstly. But because they had that desire to know God, they went back into the word of God. And when the word of God became their foundation, that's when they discovered who Jesus Christ was as well. Um, a lot of the times and sometimes in the church, people just say, oh, I just do my own thing in regards to Jesus. I don't read the Bible. I just try and experience Jesus. You can't do that because then it's like, I'm not saying you can't experience who Jesus is, but you can't experience who he is fully. Because all you're experiencing is like a third, not even a third, like one sixty fourth of who Jesus is. And if you only if you're experiencing such a little glimpse of Jesus, that's a glimpse that can be easily imitated by anything in the world and that can also take you away as well. Which is why having a solid word foundation and a solid foundation in God's word is very important. And we need to make that and that's my first point in regards to how do we defend ourselves against false doctrine and theology which we see in the people of Berea. We need to make the God or the word of God our sole foundation for truth and error. So God's word gives us the ability to decipher and to understand that. Let me rephrase that same point. We need to look into God's word as our sole foundation. I'm not just looking into it, but again, spirit of discernment will also help us to know and to decipher and understand his word, to even greater levels than what we could even do before as well. And number two point, that responsibility is on us. The responsibility is on us to search his word and search his scriptures daily. The responsibility is on us to want to go into his word. And lastly, what's the third way we can um, defend ourselves against false doctrine and theology? We need to receive and be privy to God's full truth. That means we need to soak ourselves in his word and in our understanding of who he is and our understanding of him as well.
all these things are very very important next let's talk about the forces of the online world so just to recap so far we've talked about um the forces of doctrine and theology what doctrine all of those things mean we've talked about science to recognize false theology and doctrine and we've also talked about how we defend ourselves against false doctrine and theology let's talk about the forces of the online world this one will be quite brief because i believe you know it but as christians an important medium in which the devil uses right now is the online world we need to be wise and we need to be smart in regards to the devices in which the enemy sometimes uses and let's look at second corinthians 2 verse 11 which talks about the importance of being smart and self savvy second corinthians 2 11 second corinthians 2 11 it says in order that satan might not outwit us for we are not unaware of his schemes in order that satan might not unaware us for we are not unaware of his schemes that means we need to be aware of his schemes and we need to have our minds present in regards to the schemes in which satan might use and online is a key one i'm not saying everything online is wrong because we as christians we use online to propagate god's word as well and we use online to make it a place of light but we also need to be aware of the schemes that satan uses and this can be messages true messages perpetrated in the media which are against god's word so these are messages about sexuality identity joy purpose and direction again i said before it's not a matter of right and wrong but it's a matter of god's way or the other way and in this case the other way anything which doesn't align to what god is saying is wrong what god is saying won't be true what god is saying won't be right oh sorry what god is saying is true and it will always be right that's what i meant to say the word of god is always true the word of god is always right what i'm what i was going to say was what the world says won't be true what the world says won't be right god's word is always 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 right and again what's something we also need to look out for we as christians we can also inadvertently or accidentally propagate these false words actually by spreading false messages um i'm going to use a brief example even in regards to a lot of the the things um that happen in the world sometimes sometimes christians or christians can sometimes be the biggest culprits inadvertently because they're not using their spirit of discernment they'll just read one thing off some website and start posting it on whatsapp group chats and things like that but is that really what god is saying did you really look into the word to hear what God is saying? Did you really even ask God that God is what I read true? And I think those things are very, very important to do. And it's also things we should stir up as well in, within ourselves. And they would really, really help us. Really, really help us. And let's, we just have to pray for God to just give us spirit of discernment. So now, lastly, we'll talk briefly about the forces of the individual. So falsehood of the individual is all about knowing what God is saying to us for ourselves. Not for anybody else, for ourselves. And that means we shouldn't be led astray by other people. So the way I see falsehood of the individual, like I mentioned before, it can be in two ways. It can be sometimes we hear words and we read things, we take it in, but then we start to deceive ourselves in regards to what god wants because it might not be palatable to us at the time it might not be what we want to hear but that's us being fake to ourselves and telling ourselves a fake truth as it were and that's us giving ourselves a falsehood but sometimes they can hear falsehoods from other people false teachers and everything else and that's impacting us as an individual so, so those are the two ways i've seen it and it's very very important because and something we need to be careful of because even in regards to people with high credentials, somebody might be a general overseer of a church. But again, we need to be like the Berean Christians and going to God's word to ensure that what they're saying is true. Berean Christians were talking with Paul, who at that time, apart from Peter, these guys were the big, big dogs of the church at the time, metaphorically. And yet, even when Paul said something, they didn't just say, oh, Paul, this guy is a big guy. They actually went into the word is this right is this true and they proved it and that should be the same for us for anything we hear prophecies words of encouragement words of knowledge anything we need to make sure that we certify by god the same holy spirit that lives in them lives in us and the same holy spirit that spoke to them can also speak to us as well 
But again, what does this go back to? We need to make sure we have a foundation in God's word. And we need to make sure that's outstanding. And um, also, last point, we need to know that what God says about us can never be shaken. And if God says something to us, and we know that's God saying it. Nobody else can say anything that's actually contrary. Because if it's contrary, and we are certain that God is saying what he's saying to us, God can't say contrary things to us. And I, I think it is in regards to so many instances in life and what people may say. That's why sometimes we need to be very firm in what we hear. We need to be very firm even in regards to knowledge we hear from people as well. We need to be sure that it's truly God speaking. Very, very sure that it's truly God speaking. And lastly, I'm just going to briefly go over some signs of false teachers. Again, I'm not saying that, oh, this pastor is wrong, this pastor is false. That's not what I'm saying here. I'm just saying things that we should look out for as individuals. So number one, false teachers aim to please God. So sorry, false teachers aim to please men, not God. And their teaching sometimes please the air more than profit the heart. So let's look at First Thessalonians 2, 1 to 7. First Thessalonians 2, 1 to 7. And this is my last point before I round up. First Thessalonians 2, 1 to 7. So in First Thessalonians 2, 1 to 7, it says, You know, brothers and sisters, that our visit to you was not without results. We have previously suffered and be treated outrageously in Philippi, as you know. But with the help of our God, we dare to tell you his gospel in the face of strong opposition. For the appeal we make does not spring from error or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. On the contrary, we speak as those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We are not trying to please people, but God who tests our hearts. We know that, you know, sorry, verse 5, you know, we never use flattery, nor do we put on a mask to cover up greed. God is our witness. We are not looking for praise from people, not from you or anyone else. Even though as apostles of Christ, we could have asserted our authority. Instead, we were like young children among you. Just as a nursing mother cares for her children. Sorry, one second. Yeah, just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we cared for you. Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. Surely you remember, brothers and sisters, our toll and hardship. We work night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preach the gospel of God to you. You are witnesses, and so is God, of how holy, righteous and blameless we were among you who believed. And again, the key things here, for me anyway, is from verse 4. It says they were not like, or verse 3 and 4, it says they were not like other people who are trying to spring up things, trying to trick them in how they spoke. However, when they spoke, they were speaking as people approved of God. They were not trying to please people. That's the most important thing. Sometimes the things we hear, especially from church, might not please us, but it's what God wants. And I think that's some, something we also need to be privy to as well. They were not trying to please, and these are from, from good preachers of God's word. It might not be what we want to hear at the time, but is what God wants us to hear. But we need to be careful when people say things that we always want to hear. Whereas there's not a solid foundation in what God wants to hear. I'm not saying that everything God says won't be things we want to hear. Because most of the time they go hand in hand. But sometimes you just need to be very, very careful in regards to making that distinction. So next thing, or next point. False preachers throw scorn and reproach at representatives of God. So we need to be careful when we have people who throw reproach or shade at other preachers. Um, I think sometimes it's hard to tell, hard to tell somebody truly stands for God. However, if we go through everything and everything that we've seen, if somebody else is throwing reproach at somebody else who says they're a preacher of God, that's really God's place to be doing not you so we should never ever ever throw reproach or ever 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 throw shade or anything at other people at all and lastly number three false teachers are driven by their own wisdom head and heart so they go on things of themselves first and not of god so let's quickly open jeremiah 14 14 to 16 jeremiah 14 14 to 16 
and in this it said then the lord said to me the prophets are prophesying lies in my name and this was about jeremiah i have not sent them and this was god saying it to jeremiah i have not sent them or appointed them or spoken to them they are prophesying to you false visions hmm, divinations hmm, idolatries and the delusions of their own mind therefore this is what the lord says about the prophets who are prophesying in my name I did not send them, yet they are saying no sword or famine will touch these land. These same prophets will perish by sword and famine, and the people they are prophesying to will be thrown out into the streets of Jerusalem because of the famine and sword. There will be no one to bury them. Their wives, their sons, and their daughters, I will pour out on them the calamity they deserve. What is God saying there? In this instance, these were people who were saying, oh, God is saying this thing, God is saying that thing, God is saying this. But it wasn't God that was saying it. They were being driven by what they wanted people to hear, which links back to the last point. Because at the time, Jeremiah said God was going to send a large famine to the land. And there were people who were saying, there were prophets, that, oh, God won't do that, God won't do this, God won't do that. Yet, God was saying, these people are saying rubbish. They're lying. They're, what they're saying, they're following their own wisdom, they're following their own head and hearts, they're following what they want people to say. And God is saying, that's not true. That's not true at all. And number four, false teachers gloss over the gospel and focus on other things. So again, this is where we start to get into the key distinction in telling the difference between truths and things which seem like they can be true but are not. Because these people, they will include word from the bible or they'll say things which makes it look a bit more christian however is what they're saying truly putting christ at the center is jesus christ at number one of everything that's said if you look at first timothy first timothy first timothy 1 3 to 7 first timothy 1 3 to 7 now this one i think i'm going to get people wherever that you are to just have a read of it yourself first timothy 1 3 to 7 1st Timothy 1 3 to 7 actually I'm just going to briefly read it 1st Timothy 1 3 to 7 this was Timothy talking to the people in Macedonia as I urged you when I went into Macedonia stay there in Ephesus so that you may command certain people not to teach false doctrines any further or to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies such things promote controversial speculations rather than advancing God's word which is by faith the goal of this command is love which comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Some people have departed these things and have turned to meaningless talk. They want to be teachers of the law but do not know what they are talking about or what they so confidently affirm. That's why it's important we know who God is for ourselves. And again, it goes back to the foundation of God's word. But it also goes back to this point. So these people, they will... Sometimes they say very confidently things in the word. However, the way they talk about it, they gloss over it, look over it quickly. And then they talk about other things which are in the world, which are not necessarily wrong sometimes having, you know, Yashi, and I'm not going to say anything specific um, because, again, I'm not talking about individual preachers, but they're things we should be look at very important in regards to if somebody's talking about, if they're spending more time talking about improving ourselves personally rather than things of God because preachings aren't meant to be purely for motivational purposes however they should be a balance and i think again god should be at the center and the jesus christ should be a center of messages which promote god's word even in ourselves and for our lives and that can be motivational to ourselves and that can be encouraging to ourselves but which promotes god's word and what god truly wants for us and that might not always be encouraging it might not always be one of what we want to hear and just being able to recognize that balance are key things we need to look out for and again number five false teachers try to use clever language and appearance to disguise themselves and that can be seen in galatians 6 12 to 14. again all these things just be, and also key caveat just because somebody dresses nicely or uses big words or big language that doesn't mean i'm saying they're false teacher either some people can just talk like that generally and that's fine <laughs> So these are all key things and just a few things which I think are important, even in regards to things to look out for, for false teachers. But the most important thing and the most important tool we have is the spirit of discernment, which was given to us by Jesus Christ. So I think that's where I'm going to end it. Wherever we are, whatever we do, the most important thing from all of this is to pray for the spirit of discernment. 
I've given us things to look out for and Bible verses which I encourage you to read in your own time and hopefully food for thought for each and every one of us, even for me as well. However, God has given you the spirit and his spirit is in you. So we need to cultivate using that spirit, which includes the spirit of discernment and also the ability to do great and wonderful things. And hopefully by God's grace, he will help us to identify falsehoods in this 21st century world we are living in. Thank you so much for watching, guys, and I hope you have a great day. Let's just do a quick closing prayer just to finish it off. Father, Lord, I thank you for everything, Lord. I thank you for your grace, for your mercy. Lord, I am so grateful for anyone who may be watching this right now, whatever, and in any situation they find themselves in. Father, Lord, I pray that you shall speak to them in the mighty name of Jesus. If they may find themselves in an environment where they are surrounded by falsehoods, Father, help to open their eyes of discernment, Lord. And most importantly, encourage them and give them the strength to even want to delve further into your word and see what your word says about all these different things. Oh Lord, I give you all the grace and adoration. Father, please cleanse us, make us whole, make us new. Empower us, Lord, to be who you want us to be. Lord, we give you all praise and adoration. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, guys. And I wish you all the best. Bye.